Our minds are structured by nature to function within this world in a certain way. This structure should be observed and contemplated as a helpful tool towards realization of one's own essence and also of one's own condition. If we draw the common allegorical parallel of this world being a movie, then we can observe the structure as follows. First in the lower level is the personality. This is the persona, guise or character. It emerges from contact with the world and from education within it, be it formal or informal types of education. As we contact with others and events occur during our lifetimes, characters or personalities are shaped from them in relation to the actor behind them. Characters are mortal in the sense that they can die within the same lifetime of the mind and be replaced by other characters that are born and are considered by the ego as more suitable to deal with a changed world context. It is important to emphasize that a character or personality is a guise, a facade, not an essence. However, if the ego becomes enamored or attached to a character, he may hold on to it even when it has become obsolete. In the next level is, consequently, the ego. This is the actor in the allegory. That is, if the personality is the character in a movie, the ego is the actor playing that character. However, the actor has forgotten through amnesia that he is an actor playing a character or several characters over time in movies. So the actor can decide at certain points of his context in the movie to let go of certain personalities being worn, or at least partial traits of them, to replace with others. Or the actor can also decide to hold on to an entire personality as it is. The ego here, being an allegorical actor, is therefore residing in between two existences. The one inside the movie, where he relates to the characters, his and others, and the allegorical movie script, and the one outside the movie, where he relates to the living being and essence that is behind the actor. These two existences do not communicate directly, for if truth was to interact directly with the movie world, the world would dissolve, because, being false, it could not coexist with truth. This actor is, therefore, eternal, in the sense that he only exists while he has any connection to time, and time only exists within a movie being played. So, when an ego leaves the movie, he leaves time and is reintegrated back into his own corresponding and individual living essence, that is, the Son returns to the Father by the Holy Spirit. At the next level, then, we have the living being, the essence. This is the origin of our manifestation here, our individual life and truth, uncreated, because creation only occurs in allegorical movies or worlds. It is outside of time and, therefore, it is timeless and immortal. Being living and true, it is also innocent and pure. However, it observes through the ego, who in turn observes through the characters or personalities and world contexts, the potential unmanifested reflections of itself. Through it, the essence can contemplate and test the consequences of potential manifestations which allows it to add wisdom to purity, balancing it, or maturing it, so to speak. Also, there are three sub-levels of experience within the world in connection to its mind. The higher is the conscious, where the ego is, or is supposed to be if it did not choose to fall from there, right at the frontier between the metaphorical movie and true life. The lower is the subconscious, where the shadows or inverted reflections are. 
and the middle one is the unconscious, where the mortal characters dwell, seemingly without control, knowledge, or memory. These three could be equivalent to heaven, hell, and purgatory. Now, this is a very simplified presentation of such structure, of course, but a few important points can be contemplated and derived from it. One is that the ego's amnesia serves the purpose of testing its current wisdom level, so to speak. If one is again and again asked a question whose answer will have a consequence, then if one remembers the consequence and not the essential reason for a correct answer, in a manner of speaking, wisdom is not obtained, merely an avoidance of an unpleasant consequence. A metaphorical way to view this would be to see the question as a moral decision. Will your character abuse another character for gain? Now, if there was, let's say, an unpleasant consequence for deciding yes, for example, if the consequence is being caught and imprisoned by the police in that context, then when the question was asked again in another cycle, in a different movie context, to the same actor or ego, but to a different character. If the amnesia wasn't there, the only reason for the ego to prefer to answer no would be to avoid an unpleasant consequence for his character, not because it had attained the essential wisdom behind the question itself. A true test can only be done if the ego does not recall the previous times it was asked the same question, nor the consequences for the decisions made. Wisdom is the ability to recognize the essential truth behind any potential decision without having to take it. That is why the individual, pure and innocent living essence, is obtaining wisdom by surrogate experience. Another reason for this amnesia is to allow for social clean slates. That is, if the actor knew all that his and any other character had done, and been in several turns of the contextual scripts of the allegorical movie, it would make it impossible to decide with impartiality and honesty. Things like, I was cruel to him that time, or he was cruel to me in that context, would get in the way of an authentic decision and therefore in the way of obtaining a piece of wisdom. Guilt and victimhood, or victim and guilthood, are temptations that, when given into, force a shutting down of the ego actor upon a single character due to the attributed traumatic weight of his experience. A good parable for this is shown in the movie Inc. I -N -K, from 2009, which, despite being low budget, successfully conveys many of these points. If you haven't watched it yet, and if your character can sit through low-budget movies for their sheer message, while always keeping your filters on, of course, then I will say no more of it, so as to not spoil it for you, if you plan to give it a go. Anyway, the main means through which a character, personality, or guise sort of solidifies on an ego is through automatism. This means that a character develops according to the context in relation to its ego's wisdom or moral tonality and its interaction with the other personalities, socially. This programs certain automatic responses that belong to the guise being worn, not to the ego. So the personality responds automatically to whatever types of stimuli or contextual situations through eventually acquired and nurtured habit. However, that automatism does not necessarily match the moral or wisdom level of the ego, potentially generating a conflict. In those cases, the actor no longer controls the character, but has lost himself buried in it, due to the habitual automatic responses. This is why, and I will reiterate it here again, a strong ego is of such importance, 
because the ego, when healthfully strengthened morally, is in a much better position to override the unwise or immoral automatic responses and unprogram the character or let go of it altogether if needed. The ego is not an enemy. He should not be attacked. In fact, the ego is the key factor in one's mind to be able to contemplate and to decide. He is a guardian. The world script vies to pull everyone to character or personality level, that is, to the level of identification, as observed in a previous contemplation. However, even though the movie addict's intention is nefarious, the temptations they lay out actually merely ask our characters continuous questions and put them in decision-making situations. Without them, there is no proper test and, more importantly, no proper reflection of our own potential. So the character must allow the actor, the ego, to decide from a position of higher wisdom, which already implies a certain loss of identification. With all this, I am not speaking from any position of superiority. In fact, I am only able to observe and receive these realizations exactly because I am as much involved in them as any other, as any of you. The partial solution, if solution would be the right word here, is not for our characters, guises or personalities to turn their backs on the world altogether, but to find a middle point as centered as is possible and or allow for that central position to be provided by the live communicating ego who can see far better but will never speak words as they are an integral part of the programming language of characters for the movie. So the ego communicates with the personas by implying answers, by showing clues or paths to them. For instance, as described in the contemplation named Miracles, which requires observation and attention on the part of the personality that, again, makes it lose identification or attachment, allowing reconnection to the ego or actor and, consequently, to the living essence beyond, the one actually sending the message. Now, it is observable that there are characters that do not seem to have any ability to connect to the life beyond and others that have already voluntarily given up their connection. Although even there, we are sometimes surprised by sudden shifts of moral awareness and wisdom. But these NPCs are also integral parts of the continuous questions we are being asked about ourselves. The more we answer with the automatic programs of the personality, the more we sink deeper into the movie script, only seemingly made worse by our awareness of its falsehood, because part of that integral ignorance is gone from the character, and he can no longer enjoy the bliss of not knowing, now that responsibility has been given to him. So, faith, or trust, comes in. Trust in an ego who is in contact with true life, and the wisdom our character's experience can offer. Reason alone is insufficient, and only faith is incomplete. It is by contemplating from a middle point, or as in the middle as is possible in the context, that all forces are balanced and truth can find us. There is no question about life's love for even the least of us, to the point of allowing our decisions to be sovereign, often against our very interests. However, if the internal decisions were not sovereign, then the questions themselves would be void, given that the answers would have been forced by the one who would ask them, and, consequently, the world would have never even been created.